June the 22nd, 2023, we as a commission operate under the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 131, Section 40, the Wetlands Protection Act, and Chapter 26 of the Town of Danvers General Bylaw, the Wetlands Protection Bylaw. <clears throat> After each applicant presents his or her request and the board has had time to ask questions and discuss the project, we will accept questions from the audience. Because this is a public meeting, it is required by law that you give your name and address before you speak. Although we may disagree on the issues raised, all persons present during this meeting are expected to be civil to all other meeting attendees. This includes members of the commission, the staff, abutters, concerned citizens, property owners, and project applicants. <clears throat> we also request that you confine your questions to the project and only as it pertains to the Wetlands Act. We cannot handle nor do we have jurisdiction over matters such as noise or traffic. All problems not related to the Wetlands Protection Act and the Town of Danvers Wetlands Protection Bylaw must be taken up with other appropriate boards. Okay, our first order of business be a roll call. Peter Wilson is present. Vanessa Curran? Present. Ann McGill? Present. And Michael Splain? Yeah. Okay, the first order of Business on our agenda is um, a notice of intent for 57 River Street, DEP file number 14-1399. This is a continuation of the hearing from our June 8th meeting. Uh, and Mr. <coughs> Griffin is here to represent the applicant. Yes, thank you and good evening. Um, Mr. Penny apologizes that he can't be here this evening. He enjoyed meeting you at the site walk, but uh, had a prior commitment that made it impossible for him to be here tonight. Um, 
we've made a few adjustments to the plan based on the comments received at the meeting and, and at our site walk. Um, it's still roughly the same plan, but uh, we had uh, lowered the uh, beach sand a little bit by about six inches as compared to its previous elevation. That was intended to be sure that the sand can't flow off site during a storm event. We've raised the wall along the shoreline up six inches to provide a little bit more resilience at Mr. Penny's request. We've added some instructions for invasive species control. You remember we saw the Phragmites creeping towards the flagpole and uh, we saw some knotweed along the deck. Uh, and so we've, we've provided those uh, instructions, which are primarily to you know, get a licensed applicator to apply some herbicide in the first go around and then after that do some hand pulling and uh, management. Uh, they're both relatively small areas and so we don't think it requires a, a big uh, effort. Uh, Mr. Penny also retained a landscape architect, Paul Maui of Andover, and you can see the many dots in the uh, uh, sort of that mitigation area at the bottom part of the page there and up along the street, along River Street. Uh, Mr. Maui's identified a number of uh, shrubs uh, from the CZM recommended list to place in both of those areas that can tolerate a little bit of shade, specifically in the, uh, the area to the bottom of the page. and. Uh, be appropriate for this shoreline location. Uh, there was also a, an addition of a root barrier trench along the Phragmites that separates that mitigation area from the thick stand of Phragmites. Um, and that's basically a, a 36 deep, 36 inch deep trench with a plastic barrier in it to prevent the rhizomes from coming into the, the mitigation area. Um, there was a, uh, a comment, a suggestion to put a watertight lid on the cistern so that if there is a large storm event, there's no chance of the irrigation system getting inundated with salt water. So we've done that. And uh, we had updated our mitigation table as I think we had uh, underestimated the uh, impacts in the zero to 25 in the first go around. So we've corrected that. Uh, but uh, uh, that's the uh, extent of our adjustments. And I'd be happy to address any questions at this time. Bill, oh, could you just, I'm sorry. Uh, Bob, could you just um, point out the different uh, uh, jurisdiction lines for us? Yeah. So. It should be a pointer up there for you to use. I don't think it's there, Bill. That works. That works. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> site you may recall is uh, in the riverfront zone because it's within 200 feet of the Danvers River so we have you have jurisdiction over the entire site we also have a flood zone that encompasses most of the site there's the elevation 10 that black line there and the black line 10 returns uh, so the area to the east so between the, the dark line and the street the dark line in the water and the building in the water is in the flood zone okay so the structure predominantly is out of the flood zone. So there's That's correct. No, uh, the specialized uh, basements are not required. That's correct. And our, our building addition is in uh, a portion of the flood zone, but we're going to raise that floor elevation up to 11 and a half. So it's more than one foot above the uh, flood elevation for this site. And we're raising it up that distance so that it will match the existing garage at the building. Okay. And you have a waiver request in, so you could just point out what the waiver request is for. Um, so we have uh, a waiver for um, construction of the wall in the zero to 25 foot range and this was 355 square feet uh, and it was I think uh, just a few percent of the um, uh, of the allowed 25% uh, uh, on the lot if I have those if I remember those numbers correctly. It's not so 25%, right? No, no, so 3% of the no disturb zone, and I think it was a, is the threshold 10%? Yeah. 
It's 10% 10 10 in the 0 to 35 and 20% overall into the 50. So, okay. But either way, he's well under it. He's 3%. well within it. Okay, so yeah, so 3% of the NDZ and, uh, and that's it. So there's no structures going in the 35 to 50 zone. Okay, and there's the only excavation per se is for the, the, the for the foundation for the new garage. Um, there'll be a little bit of excavation for the trench, right, for that mitigate, for the barrier trench and for the construction of the wall along the shoreline. Okay, and erosion control is gonna be on both yeah. sides of the, the wall construction? That's correct. Okay, <coughs> probably asking too many questions. So, so let me pass it off. Mike, do you have any other questions? Well, the wall construction, is that sensitive to the tides? I mean, does it, is so, it impacted by the tides when you- No, not, re not really in that the wall is well above the mean high water line. Um, and, and we did that in part because that's where the stones are today that we're putting the wall in the same location. It also avoids us having to go to get a chapter 91 permit. Right. And the um, the area of the Fragmite where the uh, where he was putting the grass cuttings, which for some reason seemed to work to mm -hmm. prevent the further spread. But we agreed you're going to put you're going to trench that, and uh, we just talk about that and who's going to do that. <coughs> right. So um, we I don't know if you can pan this picture a little bit to the left. Uh, Georgia, but we have a, tr a trench diagram, there it is, on the plan, and it shows the 36-inch deep trench with the plastic barrier in there right next to the Fragmites. Uh, so Mr. Penny's uh, landscape contractor will uh, install that barrier trench. When but you're you right, he's down three feet. That's not wet? That's not? Um, well, it, uh, this time of year, I think he'll be able to get down you know, three feet if he was trying to do it in the winter or early spring that he might encounter some groundwater. Uh, but I think it's certainly advisable to try to do it during the, the dry season. All right. Yeah. Okay, that's all I had. Thank uh, you. On the, the plot plan, uh, Bob, could you just show us where that trench yep. goes to and from? We could pan back, please. The plan back. So there, it's that line right there. Okay. Mike, you all set? Yeah, I'm all set. Ann, any questions, comments? Uh, the, that uh, trench is, leaves out a portion at the end there. Is there a reason for that? So there was a little bit of Phragmites that was starting to creep towards the flagpole here. Okay. And uh, we felt that this area could be handled with the invasive species control. Uh, we're also going to replant this area with some salt tolerant grasses. But I think the combination of you know, doing some hand pulling and some herbicide application in this particular area where the Phragmites are starting to expand will we'll, uh, handle that issue and keep them from creeping up further towards the flagpole. Okay. Is there a way to do that without using herbicides? Um, I, I think the herbicide is a little bit more effective at controlling the Phragmites, but you could, you could potentially do it with just trying hand pulling and, and keeping more. after it. But it's just, but just it's concerned difficult. about runoff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it would be a, you know, a, a, a short-term application of herbicide directly to the vegetation. Um, so I don't know that it would necessarily need to a lot of runoff. And I understand that the herbicide, you just said uh, I don't become, know. the herbicide becomes inactive after a very short period of time. So it's, okay. a, it's, not a very, it's not persistent in the environment, you would say. What is the herbicide? It's a rodeo or Roundup. Uh -huh. Glyphosate. I don't think I'm in favor of that. All right, well, let's, uh, let's stick to the manual methods then. Again, it's yeah. not a large area. I think we'll be all right. Good, thank you. All right. And any other questions? No, the, you've taken care of the, the cistern issue with the, the lid on the, the cistern. The watertight lid, yep. that's correct, yep. yep. Okay, all right. Uh, Vanessa, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, thank you. So um, I had a similar question to Anne so it looks to me like the thick red line is um, highlighting where the trench is going to be, the Phragmites barrier trench, the thick red line that's to the south. And I, I noticed the same thing that I think she was getting at, that some of the mitigation plantings seem to be on the wrong side of the trench. It's about five, one C and four H's that I see that's near that box that says proposed erosion control. Good point. Yeah, we should move those. 
Yeah, because I was thinking if the frag, like, they're going to be probably overtaken. So it, either the trench needs to move or the plants should move, I think. No, the plants should move, but thank you for noticing oh. that. Sure. And then I guess we can talk a little bit more about, so this plan for eradication for the Phragmites where it's encroaching in the salt marsh. So Mike and I were on site, and where it is in that area is very minimal. So I'm wondering if we could maybe possibly do herbicide but do like a hand wiping operation instead of spraying because right there it's like really sparse i do think that hand pulling is going to be very labor intensive yeah. and it's going to have to happen like repeatedly i think I, i'm not necessarily in favor of spraying but i know you can like there's like this technique that you can like dip a glove in it and you wear like a plastic glove and you put like an absorbent glove over it and you like hand wipe each individual stem so then you're not over spraying or going on the salt marsh grass or any of that thing so i don't know if the commission would be open to stipulating like extremely targeted hand applied herbicide versus spraying but just the phragmites is it's really sparse there i think it could be handled obviously what's to the south in like the big beds is way too much to handle um, but where it's encroaching into the salt marsh it's very minimal right now and it would certainly be great to get rid of it And then my only other question or comment was um, when Mike and I were on site, we did notice that to um, the south, where it's basically the Phragmites area, um, Mr. Penny was dumping his grass clippings there, which weirdly had the effect <laughs> seeming to keep the Phragmites from spreading any further. But there was also some tree limbs and other things. So I think we probably want to put in the condition of no dumping, like yard waste or grass clippings in that area anymore. Mm -hmm. That's in the new planting area, Vanessa? Um, it's kind of along the edge of the Phragmites, I would say. And we talked about it on site because he, it looked almost like these little, I don't know if it looked like hay bales, but they were like just pi like piles of grass clippings and the yeah. Phragmites doesn't yeah, seem to come really past weird. them, but we're not really aware of like a scientific basis for that happening. It just kind of happened. Yeah, I remember we talked about that, and I don't know if you or your your client thought that somehow the grass clippings were preventing the Phragmite from spreading. Is there any basis for that? Uh, the only basis is that he's been doing it for 12 years, and it seems to have been effective. Now, he uh, we did talk to about not doing that in the further, in, you know, any further, and he's okay with that. And I think the. Uh, uh, trench, the barrier trench will have the same effect as the grass clippings anyway. So he'll, he'll get his contractor, his uh, landscape contractor to remove the grass clippings and will no longer dump them in that location. Uh, and in, in okay. regards to the uh, invasive species control, obviously, I, I, you know, I can go either way. I've heard of this technique that Vanessa described before, it's, you know, referred to as the bloody glove technique. Where the, yeah, you know, the, I've heard of that too. <laughs> uh, and and it, you know, it does uh, seem to be effective, and, and it's obviously you know, a very localized application of herbicide. But uh, uh, we can try doing it without it for a year, and if we need to come back, we could come back. Or you do it manually, and if it's a problem, come back. Yeah. Okay, right, so you're, and then... You're okay with doing the... Either way is fine, yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll... Uh, I guess we just make the commission. We don't want this herbicide spray. No, I don't want to start that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you all set, Vanessa? Yeah, I just want to mention, too, that when we were on site, we noticed um, kind of along the riprap existing wall, there was a, like a very small new Japanese knotweed plant coming up. So we pointed that oh, out, yeah. and he had another mm -hmm. one by his deck, too. So I don't. I don't know how effective Japanese they were, knotweed. especially the uh -huh. one, the yeah. one by the, the one by the, um, it was kind of like in front of the deck, kind of in the yeah. sand area where that's going to go. So hopefully that will get dug up or, but it's small now, but it needs to be addressed because I was just saying, if you see along the rail trail, how crazy it's gotten, he should definitely try to address it now while it's small and manageable. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there any public comment or questions? That woman had her hand up. Uh, ma'am? Oh, ma'am, could you go to the lectern and it's, uh... I can No, we, we, have we, we need to record it. It's recorded. If you want, we, if we're we'll bring the mic to you. 
I said my name is Charlene Casey and I live at 345 Maple Street, Danvers. Between me and Danvers Animal Hospital is a swamp area or wetlands, whatever you want to call it. And I want to know how this is going to affect us. You're up by the Danvers Animal yep. Hospital on Route yep. 62? I live in the house just before at the end of the cul-de-sac right across from Christina's. Right, so I don't see how this would have uh, much effect on your property. It's down by the water. Down Sandy yeah, Beach. Yeah, I know, but why did, why did they send me a thing of intent for a bicycle? So that's the oh, it's a different, it's a different item. Oh, okay, well, I didn't get an agenda, so. You're right there in the front. That's right. Okay. You raise your hand again, we'll call on you then. I'll get it, I'll get it. Uh, Mr. Bradstreet. So you're back in your familiar seat. Bill Brad, Bill Brad Street, town meeting member, precinct one. Can you make a condition about pulling those weeds? Set a period of time, and someone to check. It's done every month, three months whatever the period of time is, so that it can be checked to see if they're, not that I don't trust the man, but to see that what he's saying will be done is actually done. Good point. Mm -hmm. The other thing was the trench she's talking about with the plastic barrier. Is that a state standard that three feet isn't sufficient to keep roots from going underneath? Good question. Good question. In regards to Mr. Bradstreet's question about the depth of the trench, uh, there are some suppliers of this root barrier uh, plastic material, and they're the ones that recommend 36 inches. And frankly, I, I don't know that I've seen uh, Phragmites roots going down below 36 inches. I think they generally uh, are in the upper 12 to 24 at the most. So I think the 36 is going to be adequate. But I think if we get in there and we're digging a trench and we're seeing rhizomes below that, then we'll have to uh, adjust our plan. Is there any scientific data on the, the the depth of the roots for the Phragmites? That would be a specific question I'm not sure the answer of, but knowing they also are going to have um, the, bar the plastic barrier panels and then they're going to top fill it, I, I think that's more assurance than the grass clippings we're seeing now and those are being effective. So mm -hmm. an alternative argument, I think this, this configuration could be successful based on what he's doing now. Okay. Sure, go ahead. The last thing uh, Roundup was mentioned for treating these, to my understanding, Roundup has a very poor reputation. We're not in favor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Poor reputation for uh, health concerns. But right. I think it, it's right. effective yeah. as yeah. the herbicide. Yeah, but can't. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Is there any other public know? comment or questions? No? Uh, Okay, so the first thing we need to do is close the public hearing. So someone can make a motion to that effect? I make a motion that we close the public hearing for 57 River Street. I'll second, second. the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, okay, next up we need to vote on a waiver for uh, work within the, the 35. Yep, and the 50, uh, and the 50 uh, and no build. Be, yep. um, it's bordering the saw marsh. They're going to have an erosion control on either side of the work. Uh, so I personally, and I have no problem with the granting waiver for that. So uh, if anyone else agrees, we can have a motion. If someone disagrees, just let us know, and we'll vote accordingly. No, no. It's okay. All right, I'll make a motion that we grant a waiver for work uh, done within the 35 for uh, 57 River Street DEP file number 14-1399 uh, as depicted by the applicant. I second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the next up is uh, just the motion to uh, issue an order of conditions uh, with any uh, conditions we want to attach. So someone can. All right, I'll make a motion that uh, we issue an order of conditions on the notice of intent for 57 River Street DEP file number 14-1399, uh, which allows for uh, 
construction of a, a wall along the seawall area where the rocks presently uh, located uh, that uh, the uh, Fragmite barrier be installed as depicted on the plan at a depth of 36 inches, uh, that there be no further dumping of grass clippings along that area or any other area on the site, uh, that the uh, knotwood that's been identified, I think it's Japanese knotwood, uh, be addressed as well, uh, that uh, there'd be no herbicides used on the site, that uh, any uh, spot removal will be done manually uh, and will be done uh, on a regular uh, regular basis uh, with uh, staff being apprised of uh, uh, would it be quarterly month well once active construction starts our inspector is going to that job at least once a week or once every two weeks so that uh, every be something we the, the staff be, be be inspected every two weeks yeah. uh, for the first year yeah for the first year uh, if the applicant has still has issues, he can come back before this board. Uh, that the uh, garage, uh, it, Bob, is the garage being raised uh, to be equal level with the other work? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it allowing for water to flow? It doesn't have to. Cause it's just <coughs> the garage floor is above the flood elevation, so there's no it's flood openings. How's the garage going to sit? It's going to sit on a on footings or. It, it'll uh, there'll be a slab a floor slab. with a uh, frost wall foundation around the perimeter. All right, and prove the uh, work of the garage as described. And uh, Member Curran had also noted to remove the five plantings south of the trench line need to be moved to the full planting area. Yes, the planting uh, as as uh, as. Uh, cited by Vanessa uh, Curran of this board that the planting be moved in accordance with uh, the area she pointed out. That's the motion. Good. good. That's yeah. a good one. So uh, I have just one thing that maybe we could talk about. So, all right. I know people have very, <clears throat> excuse me, strong feelings on herbicides and I'm not necessarily advocating for them just to like be applied willy nilly everywhere, but the things that we're dealing with here I, I'm wondering if we should say they should try manual management first, and then if it's not successful, they could be allowed to use very hand, the targeted hand application of herbicides. Uh, I'm not, that's not part of my motion. Uh, How do the other members uh, feel? Well, Vanessa, I, I, I'm kind of agreeing with Mike. You know, if they're willing to do um, hand control, and that, no. how many square feet are we, we, we talking about that they're going to try to work to uh, you know, Probably 100 or something like that at the most. Uh, yeah, I mean, if the applicant is willing to not use herbicides, I, I, I would like to see us do that. Okay, so then if they aren't successful, would they have to come back to us for a change? Yes. Is that how it would work? If that's what the commission wants to require, yeah. Maybe they just have to work harder at it. I don't know. Sometimes, these, especially the knotweed, it's you can pull and it will be there two days later. Yeah. Okay, well, let's see how it goes with the, the yeah. manual uh, work. The which is we could condition a one-year check-in in that he's doing the hand pulling for that initial construction and then a little bit after and after one year. Well, I think I said one year, too. Yeah. Yeah. And then no, that's yeah. why it can be reevaluated. Yeah. Can we do that? Yeah. If is that acceptable, Vanessa? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, the motion's been made. Is there a second? I second the second. motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, good luck. Great. Thank you all very much and good night. Thank you. Uh, next up is an extension for the order of conditions for 9 Tibbetts Avenue, DEP file number 14-1338. The applicant is Brian LeBlanc. And I think that uh, Bill Manuel is here to represent Mr. LeBlanc. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill Manuel, and uh, Mr. LeBlanc is requesting a one-year extension for his order of conditions. Uh, he, I, today, I filed a request to amend his order of conditions, and we'll talk about that in two weeks. So we want to keep the order open so that he can possibly do more work at his property. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's prudent to ask it. He wants to amend the order conditions to, that, 
could change what? Add more floats to get more water. Uh, okay, but that'll be in two weeks. So right now you're just looking for an extension of one year. That's correct. Right? Okay. Okay, and just uh, one quick comment. I'm, we're pleased with the, the floats that he has installed. That's what we wanted to see, so that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, any questions? I don't have any questions. Mike, do you have any questions? No. Ann, no. No? no? Vanessa? Sorry, I was muted, no. Okay, is there any public comments or questions? No? Okay. Uh, is this an open hearing? This isn't? It's not, but we have no comment anyway, so. Okay, so why, um, yeah, if someone can make a motion, we'll grant that uh, extension to Mr. LeBlanc. I make a motion that we extend a one-year extension to the order of conditions for 9 Tibbetts <coughs> Ave, Depart <coughs> DEP file number 14-1338. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm abstaining because I represented his company, AC Castle, so I'm not sure I should be voting on that. Okay. Okay. So we have three yeses anyway, so we're fine. Uh, next up is the notice of intent uh, for 54 Coolidge Road, DEP file number 14-1401. The applicants are Eric and Nicole Carlson. And uh, Mr. Manuel, you're representing them as well? I am. Bill Manuel from Wetlands and Land Management here in Danvers. Uh, this is a fairly simple project. They are looking to add uh, two little additions off the rear of the home. I call it, there's the north arrow, so there's the west addition, and that's going to be a bedroom addition. And this is the east addition. That is going to be a family room with a pantry and, and a laundry area. It happens to be, at least the west side, happens to be in the buffer zone to the banks of Frost Fish Brook, and you can see that the actual banks of the brook are off-site. And uh, uh, this is an area where the the recently the, the the brooks have been the banks of the brook have been armored, and this particular bend in the brook has been substantially armored with uh, probably about a three foot wide stacked boulder wall. So it's 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 quite the bank, quite uh, discernible uh, where the limits of the resource area are. Frost Fish Brook is a perennial stream, so this is the 200 foot riverfront area line, so the entire site is in riverfront. Uh, the overall work is is fairly simple. You can see from the contours that the backyard is essentially flat. Uh, once it gets uh, you know beyond the the fenced in area of the backyard it tends to drop off a little bit but uh, we are you know easily uh, it's 100 feet from the brook from uh, the closest point here and like 78 feet from here we show erosion control a mulch sock barrier that's going to be installed right along through here that'll be on the inboard side of an existing stockade fence so the fence goes to the ground and then for sort of a belt and suspenders approach, we just put that mulch sock in front of the fence. The entire disturbance is 777 square feet. So uh, we're allowed 10% of the riverfront area or 5,000 square feet, whichever is greater. We easily comply with that. So uh, we're, we're well within the performance standards for riverfront. So we've got uh, proper erosion control. We meet the... Uh, we're well under the impact thresholds. It's a very simple project, all in lawn area. So uh, we're hoping that the commission will issue an order of conditions this evening. Okay, just one quick question. Is there any plans for a roof runoff? Right now it's flat and everything seems to be working just fine. So we've, we'll just direct this, the uh, roof runoff right out into the grass and it will infiltrate like it's doing now. Okay, and how much excavation will be done? Uh, each of these will have a, this will be on a slab, so each of these uh, projections will have a frost wall and then a, a slab uh, component to it. So uh, there'll be excavation around the perimeter of each wall there. The soil obviously gets uh, sidecast directly to the, the trench. Once the concrete's poured, it's backfilled and anything that is not backfilled is taken off site. 
Uh, Mike, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, this might be more for <coughs> staff, but when we talk about the calculation for the alterations that are allowable, mm -hmm. do we look back to see if there were previous alterations and does that become cumulative? So they're not cumulative under our bylaw or under the DEP. It's project specific. Um, so no. No. So each time you come in, it would require a new calculation. It would not involve any prior alteration. The commission could condition and say this project has all in the order. They could say this project has altered 4.6 percent if the commission wanted to, but it's it's on a case by case basis. It's not a blanket rule. Yeah. So in the future, they could alter 6.4 percent or the rest of the square footage that's yeah. allowable. Do we have the capability to look back to see what has been altered in the That's past? That's what I was wondering. I mean, we could, but I, I would say that the riverfront alter, that's a number of properties in Woodville, and it's not something the commission's done before. Um, no, but I mean, if, if, if someone had come in previously with an alteration that brought them to the max, yeah. then could they come back with a different alteration and we don't, rec we don't consider the prior? That is a good question. I will say a lot of these properties happened before that 10% no, right. threshold yeah. came into play. So right. I would guess mm -hmm. this one's at zero in which there was no filings ever for this property. That 10% that guideline is recent, right, within the last What's three, that, 1996? 1996. 1996. But um, it is my experience that uh, if a project was constructed after 1996, you do, you, you know, that, that eats Total away at up. the threshold. Yep. Okay. So, but uh, there hasn't been any work on this property no, since but 1996. That's something we could look as we go oh, forward to, to mind, know yeah. that. Right. Yeah. You know. and I, th I think right. the town is beginning to accumulate a database. Yeah. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other, uh, the other thing for you, Bill. Um, how much impervious are we adding with the roofs? 777 square feet. All right. And the, you don't feel that you need to address any runoff. Uh, no, as I said, the backyard, I mean, the, the property from front to back is pretty flat, and it is a uniform grass cover from street to the stockade fence. Seems to be perfectly stable. There's gutters that downspouts? Right. Yeah, like yep. And what are the additions going to sit on? Uh, it's a slab. Slabs. Slabs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, no further questions. Okay. Thanks. Ann? Um, is the f is the fence all the way around the property? Uh, starts here. Okay. You know the gate yeah. at the back of the house, and the same thing over here, and then it, it, and it encloses the backyard. No. Thank you. That's it? Yeah. Vanessa. No, I don't have any questions. Uh, is there any uh, questions from the public, Mr. Bradshaw? Who are these people? Again, Bill Bradstreet, uh, town meeting member, precinct one. How do you figure the runoff from the roof that's there present and add these two areas to know that a flat surface is going to absorb, absorb all of that as opposed to the uh, downspouts leading to a dry well? A well, I had one in my yard. All of it goes into the drywall and down. It doesn't go, hopefully, and spread evenly around the grassed area and then disappear. How, how do you make sure? I, I'm not questioning his wisdom, but I'm looking at that. You're adding more flat space for the water to land on, and now it has to, I don't, again, how much is added? How much is there there now? And if you add the two of them together, is that flat area in the backyard sufficient to absorb all of the water that's, that's going to be? Question. That's my, what my, we were in, getting at. my yeah. intuition tells me that you know the, the square footage alteration limits play into that. You, know, you can't have 20 percent, 25 percent, because then that might overwhelm that. That's that's just my gut feel. I'm going to ask Mr. Manuel if he has a comment, and then I'm going to ask Georgia if she has any. I'm not sitting on the board. I'm just, it's a question that came to my mind. You have a flat surface. You're going to 
add more flat surface, more water, and where would it go? Yeah, well, oftentimes we do have dry well situations. Yes. Yeah. Um, that way you'd sure that the water would, quote unquote, disappear. Bill, would you like to comment? Sure. You know, how will we know the water's not gonna run into the brook? It's flat. Um, not all of the, uh, the runoff from the existing home is going to the backyard. There's a peak in the middle and some goes to the sheds to the front and some sheds to the back. Um, but I look at the conditions that are there now and there's no erosion or gullying or anything like that. So I think it's a reasonable to conclude that uh, what's happening now will continue to happen in the future. So you're not talking in generality. You're saying based on your view of the site and looking at the topography of the site and this, you're talking specific to this site, not just, well, generally speaking, that. that I am talking correct? specific to the site, yes. And you feel that uh, it, it won't create an issue of water running into the brook or, or flooding on the area? It, it doesn't appear that that situation would happen because the ground is so flat and it's completely covered with a, a uniform cover of grass. And the nature of the soil is it would absorb the water? It seems to be working just fine. Yeah. Okay, Georgia, do you have anything to add? I, I would say from the Conservation Commission standpoint, if there were to be water, water pooling in the yard, that's not much effect to the, the bank of the brook or Frostfish Brook, that's more of effect to the homeowner. But considering how flat it is, as Mr. Manuel indicated, there's no sheet flow going towards Frostfish. Everything dissipates in that broad area. Okay. Uh, are there any other public comments, questions? Seeing none, uh, I, I guess we can close the, the public hearing. So if someone can make a motion to that effect. Make the motion that we close the public hearing for 54 Coolidge Road, DEP file number 14-1401. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, there's no waivers required for this. It's just within no. the. Uh, okay, so if uh, someone can make a motion that we issue an order of conditions, unless uh, someone feels different. Okay. I move that we have an order of conditions that they follow the plan that they put before us in terms of. DEP file. DEP file, thank you. Number 14 1401. There's no additional conditions? There's no additional no. conditions, no. Standard conditions? Yeah. Right, yep. Mm -hmm. As is. Motion has been made. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, okay. thank you. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, next up is a notice of intent All right. uh, for 15 Beaver Park Road uh, slash 229 Maple Street, DEP file number 14-1400. Uh, in, in the applicant is uh, the town of Danvers, represented by Mr. Stephen King. Okay. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Stephen King, the town engineer for the town of Danvers, uh, Department of Public Works. I'm here tonight to, for an NOI application for an extension of our existing, or what we're building for our future rail trail. Uh, this project would intend to help our crossing at the Route 62 interchange by Vineyard, Vineyard Street, where we'd be coming up off the bank near Beaver Brook, crossing over Route 62 and going back down into the College Pond area, then continuing on to, to Nichols and Spring Street. Um, I have uh, our VHB who's been uh, assisting us with the design and permitting for the project, uh, Josh Trakis, who's the lead engineer, and I'm gonna let him walk you through the, uh, the steps in the process of how we come up with the design that's in front of you tonight. Thank you, Steve. Um, as Steve mentioned, my name is uh, Josh Triarchus from VHB. Um, also with me tonight is Dan Kanata, uh, environmental scientist with VHB, who helped prepare the NOI. Um, and I will share my screen and hope this works yes josh if you don't mind making the view on your screen full screen if possible yep awesome yeah, yeah. Much as I can. Okay. Oh, oh that's nice. good yep all right um 
I'll actually start. I can start with a, just an overall Google limits. Um, as Steve mentioned, this is uh, a portion of the, the rail trail extension uh, at the crossing of Maple Street. Our limits extend about 350 feet south of Maple Street and about 400 feet north of Maple Street uh, within the former railroad corridor. Uh, it's currently the electric utility corridor right now. Um, the project also includes, uh, I believe it's about 225 feet along Maple Street up to uh, the intersection with Vineyard Street, where as part of the uh, project, we are uh, revising the, the geometry of Vineyard Street to uh, tighten up the intersection a little bit and make this more of a 90 degree intersection. Um, so this, just to orient everyone, is rotated a little bit. North is um, towards the bottom of the screen. So this is Maple Street. Um, running up and down on the screen. And then this is the, the rail corridor or the, the current electric utility corridor running left to right. Um, as mentioned, the project will pick up where the town um, is doing another project of extending the rail trail um, to the south of Maple Street. We're proposing a 10 foot um, stone dust shared use path consistent with the rest of the um, rail trail in town. Uh, this will be on an embankment coming up um, to meet ADA requirements uh, and meet the existing elevation of Maple Street. There is an existing crosswalk uh, today mm -hmm. that crosses Maple Street that will be um, slightly shifted to meet the opening that's in the uh, current uh, stone block wall. Uh, there will be a, a rectangular rapid flashing beacon or RRFB with a, a pedestrian push button to allow users to cross the road. Um, and then on the north side of Maple Street, uh, the path will take an immediate turn um, and head towards the east slightly uh, with a retaining wall to support. There's an existing um, steep slope. It's like, it's like a one and a half or, or two to one slope on the north side of Maple Street today. Um, so it basically to, the, the path will run along that slope supported on a retaining wall. Um, and the intent of this is to stay outside of uh, bordering land subject to flooding. Um, the floodplain line is shown, if I zoom a little bit, this, this lighter blue dashed line. Um, this is on either side of Maple Street. Um, on this north side, the elevation is around 51 feet based on the FEMA mapping. Um, so we, the path was designed to um, really stay completely out of the, the floodplain um, as much as possible, we only have some very minor temporary impacts. Um, again, these are mostly just for erosion controls and for some temporary excavation for this retaining wall. Uh, but there will be no uh, permanent impacts within the floodplain um, anticipated. The path will continue to the north. Uh, again, continuing the the ten foot um, ten foot wide um, stone dust stone dust surface, um, and this will. We'll leave off um, and end about, like I mentioned earlier, about 400 feet to the north uh, to be continued future uh, as part of a future town project. Um, as I mentioned, at the Vineyard Street intersection, this will be slightly um, reduced. Uh, this is, you know, kind of a really wide, more of a Y intersection now. Uh, so this will be tightened up um, to allow for fire truck and other uh, turning vehicles. Um, this allows us to actually reduce impervious area within the project limits. Um, as I, I zoom in here, there's an existing um, asphalt sidewalk, and this is where the existing roadway, existing curb line is. So this will be pulled in. Um, the Abutters driveway at two Vineyard Street will be extended to the new curb line, um, and the existing um, asphalt sidewalk will be extended around um, and this will all be uh, grass base um, in this in this area. Um, I do have the um, wetland uh, buffer zones shown here. We're not proposing any work within BBW or within Beaver Brook itself. Um, there is some work uh, within the 35 foot um, no disturb and the um, 50 foot um, no build zone. Um, most of this is, is related to the path and some of the side slopes. We did uh, on the south side or the, the east side of the path um, on this section here. 
in this section. In this area, we are proposing a stone um, riprap slope. Um, again, this is it's it's a one and a half to one slope, and this is really to again stay out of the floodplain as best we could um, and limit impacts. Um, this will be similar to what was done where we recently installed the timber bridge for the for the rail trail. These will be uh, the stone will be over overseeded with compost and seed, so it'll it'll actually grow and become a, a, a grass slope in the end. Um, so it won't have a, a, a rocky look to it, and it won't uh, it'll help for um, animals to uh, for critters to, to to move throughout the area. Um, we are proposing um, where there are slopes that are two to one or steeper, we'll have a a, a wooden safety rail uh, with a two foot shoulder in all locations next to the path. Um, and again, where obviously we, where we have the steeper slopes, same thing, we'll have the wood railing. Um, on the wall itself, we are working with our structural engineers and determining what the, the final barrier will be. This will either be a concrete barrier or some form of a, a, a metal railing um, that, that would meet requirements for uh, fall protection. Um, the height of the wall, well, on average, is about five feet. I think at the most uh, on this corner here, it's around eight feet, and then it slowly tapers down to about you know, two, to, two to one foot on this end here. Uh, I do have another image. This just shows on an aerial background, just to try to give a little more context. Um, one thing I, I, I should also point out is that as, as part of the project, we are proposing um, a small access um access road through here for the uh town's um electric uh, uh electric division to access the utility corridor um with this with this proposed configuration this will be really tight for a vehicle to get through and this will allow um the electric division to have access to get down from maple street to uh perform maintenance um and access the utility poles in this stretch um, these are a few images just showing what the wood rail will look like. Um, this this was taken. Um, this is, has grown in since, but this is before they seeded at the the timber bridge section. What the the wood rails will look like, and this will be similar um, on either side of the path. Again, where there's steep slopes. Um, this is an example of the the RFB for the crossing across Maple Street. Uh, this, the retaining wall will be a modular block wall. Um, uh, again, this is just just an example of what this this generally will look like. Um, we'll work with the town on the specific color um, and and style, but in, in general, this would be a the, the idea of the the look that it, that it will eventually look like. And then this is a photo of um, again the recent project for the timber bridge where there was a stone steep, steep slope. This is again before before it was. Um, uh, the final seeding and actually grown in, but this is the compost that was put over the, the stone slope area. Um, with that, Dan, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add or anything that I missed. Um, well, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Dan Canada, environmental scientist with VHB. Um, yeah, Josh, I believe you really covered most most everything there. Um, again, we are not working within Beaverbrook itself or any of the adjacent uh, bordering vegetated wetland. Uh, the riverfront area work we have is either within the degraded roadway or within the disturbed utility corridor. I would also like to mention that uh, we noted this in the application. This project qualifies as a limited project uh, for uh, the construction of a uh, footpath or shared use path within riverfront area. Um, and as Josh mentioned, we also are proposing erosion controls along the entire limits of work during construction. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, I, I think that's all we have. I don't know if there's, there's any questions or any specifics you'd like us um, to go through. With this being a limited project, do they require a waiver to, to build that retaining wall within the 35? No, they do not require um, a, re a request for a waiver. Our bylaw says limited projects only are exempt from the 35 and 50, but they need to avoid them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. so. uh, okay, that's my, my first question. Mike, uh, do you have any questions? Um, well, maybe to Steve, but Steve, where exactly is the uh, the wall going? If you could, Josh, can you zoom in on the the red section of the modular yep. block wall? It's it's this uh, this pink or or kind of red highlighted area. 
the line here. And, and um, what's the length and height of the wall? So the average height is, is around five feet. Um, I, on this corner, on this end, it, it's about eight feet. And then it, it tapers down to about, you know, basically to, to zero on, on this end here. Um, the length, um, sorry, I should have this. It's about 150 feet length. Uh, and where the wall is going, what's the, what is there now? It's a slope oh. or? A yes, it's just here. I can, I can zoom in if this, if this helps. So you can kind of yeah. see that yeah. it's a steep yeah. slope today. It's behind the guardrail. Yeah. Okay. Really, that's, yeah, that's we, helpful. We would just be, yeah. So we would just be coming more or less from the bottom of this slope and just coming up with the vertical wall to support, really, uh, you know, the ten foot path that would be coming yeah. parallel to the sidewalk, but just slowly starting to come down at a at a five percent grade. All right. Thank you. That's my only question. Okay. Okay. Ann, any questions? Um. I walked this um, the, the last time that we were talking about it, and there are some wet areas along the path, at, at least when I was walking. <laughs> um, so the pa how, how will you deal with the, the moistened or the wet parts of the, the path itself? So I think for the most part, we're actually staying out of those areas. I, I do know um, for this area itself, um, Again, if, if if you bear with me, if I can actually zoom in, drop down in this area, where where really there's an existing slope today right. that comes up, and, and we're adding some fill. This is this is steeper than 88. It doesn't meet 88 compliance, so we'd be meeting existing grade here. This would this slope would be extended out. I, I in some of these areas down here, there's about three to four feet of fill to really just extend this to, to maintain the less than 5% grade. Okay. Um, but in general, this area is pretty dry because it's up, it's up a little higher. Um, on this side over here, I think this may be the area that was a little wet because this, this is the area that's within the floodplain. Yes. Um, our, our wall will be coming at the crossing here. We'll be basically breaking the guardrail and then turning to the left here and the the path will will stay high it'll actually be within this wooded area okay um, okay unfortunately some of these trees will be cleared to extend the path through here until it eventually comes back down once it's outside the floodplain okay all right thank you it's also important to note there's no real grades on the existing path right now so as yeah. we come through yeah. with the dense grade crushed stone in the in the stone dust path we're actually physically grading that path so it has a certain slope to it it's not all rutted out yeah okay correct good <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, I'm good. Vanessa, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I don't have any. Uh, okay. Uh, how will uh, stormwater flow be managed during construction? Does it need to be diverted? Uh, from, um, oh, go ahead, Dan. <laughs> no, I, I was going to say, in, in general, we'll have our erosion controls around all the limits. Uh, we can create temporary diversion swales if needed. Um, but in general, the, you know, at least the final condition, this will all be country drainage. There's, there's no um, drainage features as part of the project other than um, as it operates today. Um, Steve, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. I was going to say similar, uh, similar in nature, and as most of the trail that we've extended to this point, um, we've been able to manage and mitigate any stormwater issues uh, on site on the trail with erosion controls. Um, so there's no yeah. really additional measures beyond uh, sedimentation controls. We can do check swales while we're doing the construction work. Um, but we typically, because yeah. of some of the areas, if we're into a storm event, we typically don't work on that same time because it's hard to actually get in there and mobilize our equipment. So we usually try and stay away from those wet events. Mm -hmm. Uh, and during uh, excavation, say for the wall, where are you going to store the soil that you excavate? So whatever excess soil is not needed for any backfill around the wall, that would be uh, hauled and disposed of off-site. Okay. And uh, Anything on-site would obviously have, we'd have erosion controls around that, any stockpiles. And erosion control, it's going to be strong around the wall just to prevent any erosion? Correct. Getting into the, yep. into the wetlands there? Yep. Uh, Okay, I think uh, that's all we have. 
But just one quick question, this probably doesn't pertain so much to this project, but if you continue west, is the, stone, is the rail trail improved going towards Spring Street? Or is that the next step? That is the next phase. We're, we're breaking this up into multiple phases. So this is kind of really our phase called 1B, 1C area in the phase one of continuing to get to Spring Street. Um, then we're also working in conjunction with Mass DOT and they're going to take it from Spring and Nichols and bring it all the way to the other side near the state police barracks on Route 62. Mm -hmm. I noticed the new part coming out from uh, uh, Hobart Street. Holton Street? Hobart Street. Uh, Hobart Street. Hobart. Yeah. yeah. So they were working on that yesterday. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm sure everybody's here for this. So, uh, any public <laughs> comment? Man, put your head in it first and just tell us what your, your name is and your address and then. Uh, my name is Beth Swindell, 217 Maple Street. So, I, uh, our home is on the eastbound side of Maple Street, right be below the crosswalk. We're on the westbound? Okay. I don't know my left from my right either. Um, <laughs> but that's very true. Um, a couple of questions about the, um, the flashing light. Is there going to be any signage further on the eastbound, further up Maple Street on the eastbound side that will notify vehicles that there is the possibility of that? It's the, it sees a lot more traffic than where the electric light is, and I'm not sure that the, that vehicles will be able to stop in accordance with that. My second question is, where is the crossing guard going to park? Because <laughs> she's right smack in there. Yeah, yeah. I heard about uh, that crossing guard. Yes. Uh, I mean, Steve, if you can um, answer those uh, quickly, they really don't pertain to the wetlands so much. No, no, so, I, uh, yeah, that's true, I but guess. But just, you know, if I'll you can give her right. a quick answer just because she made the effort to come here to ask the question <laughs> uh, yeah so I guess for the on the because of the extension of Vineyard Street and changing that alignment yeah. um, obviously you wouldn't you wouldn't park there to do the crossing for the crossing guard um, they would have to find an alternate site to, to park on right. it won't be Maple Street um, as far as additional signage beyond the work limits that are shown on the on the plans here today. Um, there would typically be a crossing ahead, uh, yeah. and then the flashing beacon, obviously you press the flashing beacon, it flashes, yeah. you wait till you see a car or vehicle stop, and then you cross over the, uh, the crosswalk. Okay, thanks. Uh, sir? I'm Beth's husband, Peter Swindell, 217 Maple Street. I was, um, I know this is new. We just got that notice in the mail. You have to give us a little latitude to just, you know, we haven't had a chance. Uh, we didn't know anything about this whole thing. They just put a light at the end of Summer Street. So this is for probably Mr. King more than you guys because this is new. You know, we didn't know about this. So what about the traffic? And what about putting a turning lane to go left to Vineyard? Because the traffic just backs up constantly, constantly. The light is horrible. Maybe some people like it, but I don't. And when the traffic, when, when uh, people turn to Vineyard, they stop on Maple, and the traffic all just backs up. And if you're going to do something up there, you should probably consider a turning lane to go, so people can go in the left, so the people on Maple can keep going. I mean, I know this isn't conservation. I get that. So this, yeah. But this is a quick this, answer, this and then is, we'll move on. This is something that we haven't had any notice of, other than the, the notification that the town sent. So, you know, are, are there hearings that can? about traffic that these people can express well, so there is the traffic advisory committee which if there are concern or wanting to request that that would be separate from this project there's not much in terms of the conservation and the limits of this work it's not involving changing the traffic, the traffic rates on 62 right. which I also believe is a state highway so it may be no it's not no, Steve's no, shaking, not no. state highway um, 
but so there it's a whole different component from us but it's not something that would be right. required it'd be something requested pete um if steve wants to add something else i'm sorry i didn't hear i said it's not something that the commission can require under this project or I'm not necessarily yeah for them to require anything i'm kind of directing this to steve because okay sit down he's the man <laughs> 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 You know, I, like I said, we just haven't, we, we got the notice for this conservation meeting, and now that I see what they're going to do, it's a concern. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I can answer Mr. Swindell's question. Yeah, so at, at a very high level, um, we've had some preliminary talks um, as far as our overall concept of continuing extension this, extending the trail. Um, I believe the real trail, who, real trail committee who meets has, you know, mm -hmm. discusses this on a monthly basis on a monthly basis as well. Um, obviously, moving forward, we're just here for the permitting aspect of it and the environmental um, permitting of the project. Um, per se, if we're going to get into any traffic alignment issues or changes, um, that's something we can just, uh, just obviously discuss offline before we move forward with the project. Just because the project is going through the NOI process right now doesn't mean this is the actual final alignment that we do. But we do want to make sure that we're permitting it so that at least off this Route 62 layout, that we have the right permissions to be able to install the module block wall and do the stone dust path. So I would be obviously, as we get closer to getting into a final design, um, bidding and advertisement, then we'd obviously get together with the neighborhood and, and discuss about what we can potentially do for alleviating traffic in that area. <laughs> Pot potentially alleviate traffic in the area. And I, I Thanks, Dave. Sir? <laughs> Uh, Richard Baldock, 222 Maple Street, town meeting member, precinct four. It, this does actually go to not just conservation, but it does coincide with traffic, because if you're going to issue a, a permit for construction of the rail trail, it's going to affect everything else. That retaining wall on this east side, that's a, a steep bank. I know the town does their due diligence and the east side that's existing. Well, no, this one here. Sorry. Right. Oh, okay. They do a phenomenal job. They worked with us with the culvert. I have no complaints with the culvert. They did a great job. But if if you're gonna put a retaining wall there for a walking path down, that, that embankment is pretty steep. So and then you're gonna change the whole geography of the, the land of the lay of the land the filling for the grading of the ADA, and if you start putting the cart before the horse, you get a permit for the conservation without looking at further down the road for traffic. Once the wall's built, you can't extend the road to put a turning lane in and so forth and so forth. So I think that just leads, opens up a whole can of worms. If, if you don't have anything in in the planning stages now for the future. That's all. Okay, thanks. I think, you know, Steve alluded to the fact that this isn't the final design. So if there are more lanes to be put in, uh, that would have to be considered. Steve, does a DTAC get involved at some point? Uh, do you go before the planning board in, at, the, at some point? DTAC, yeah. DTAC would be DTAC involved, gets in involved then, right? with any traffic uh, changes that we would make. So that would be a good place to go to a hearing at, where DTAC is involved. DTAC meets m monthly, and they would post a public hearing notice. This isn't on their agenda yet. Yeah. Right. We also, have to, I'd also like to mention that obviously we're we're working on this. This is going to be phased out in multiple sections. So I'm not expecting for any construction to happen in this next in this year. You know, there's a lot of planning that still needs to go involved. This is just the first step in the whole process. And I'll also note that, and the commission may entertain it, of course, it's not my choice, but I, we had suggested a site visit, so a decision wouldn't be made tonight. It would, uh, the commission would go and view this site, and if the public is welcome, and we would have people join if they wanted, neighbors wanted to come, we could notify you of that date. It doesn't adhere to traffic, but you can get a good layout of on, on land what's going to be happening and where. Um, yeah. And I personally, I drive that road enough to know that traffic is a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, 
go, you're going to go last. <laughs> so, ma'am? Um, no, no, ma'am, you can go. Over here. Huh? All right. She's on her way. She's walking up. That's <laughs> why. Like I said, my name is Charlene Casey, and I live at 345 Maple Street, which is next to Danvers Animal Hospital, is the next building up. And I just wanted to know how it was going to affect our area. Um, like, the Y that goes off that way, where is that going to be? That's Vineyard Street. I can't tell from my seat. Can I go? Go ahead, Steve. You can um, point to it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. So if you see, uh, thanks, Josh. Put it on the Google. Yeah. So this is this is. Oh. <laughs> That's good, Josh. Okay. Her, her house is way up. It's up here, right? So I'm way up You're all up there. there. I'm opposite. My house is actually opposite Nichols and yeah. Uh, yeah. Spring Street. Yeah. Yep. So in in the future and. As we continue along with the path construction, um, that's going to be a time point when we actually have uh, working with Mass DOT. Yeah. And that's when I think you would want to get involved, and we obviously would invite you to that public hearing. Well, because well. I figured maybe the lights were going to go across the street there and and through the swamp, no. because it mentioned dredging in that intent. Go. Yeah. yeah. No. Nope. Not in. Not where you're living. Not where I'm no. living. Okay. Yeah. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> potentially in the future. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Okay, Mr. Bradstreet. Again, Bill Bradstreet, town meeting member, precinct one. I had questions, but you folks have instructed the questions about traffic and lights to the DTAC committee. So thank you, and I'll wait for them to meet. My understanding, they were uh, passing or not having one of the meetings either this month or next month. I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. I'm not on that board, but I can. we'll make sure, Bill. We can check in with Alicia and Aaron. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so just as, as Public questions, comments? I see no other hands raised. Uh, I personally would like to, to get a site visit in just to see this up close. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your timing on this, Steve? Are you, are you looking to do this in the short term, or is, this, is it funded? Uh, right now it is not funded, um, but we have a little bit of funding available from our MassWorks grant that we were awarded for constructing the wheelchair, which helps our preliminary design work. So I wanted to get that done before that funding ran out. Um, we're going to have to look at future uh, alternatives of funding sources between working with the electric light, working with our Chapter 90 funds, and possibly pursuing other grants um, through the American Recovery Act to, uh, to fund the project. Okay, so uh, like we said, we're not looking to make a decision tonight. You don't need a decision tonight. So but do uh, you need do you need approval before you can get funding? Uh, no. Good question. No. No. Uh, so, uh, are the members of the board in agreement that would like to get out there and, and see this personally? Yeah. 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 Vanessa. Should sure. We? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, timing wise do we do we want to continue to the next meeting can we get a site visit in yeah we have we have three weeks actually before the next meeting because i right. think july is a five week so july 13th is our next meeting we can definitely find a time um either a week end morning or um a week night we do have some light at the end of the night right um and i will be sure we could uh notify the butters we have the same list and everyone's address Okay, and you definitely. All right. Okay, so it, it may be we do an individual site visit with you guys, give you a VIP one when you get back, or, um, if, or if we can schedule it before July first, we will definitely try to do that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, before you guys leave, if you want to leave me your emails and phone number, that'd be great. Okay. We're miss our next meeting then. The next meeting is when, the 13th? July 13th, yeah, correct. No, I'm going to miss it. Um, so I can coordinate with Steve and then email the commission right. about what dates work. Okay. All right. So you just let Georgia know what your, your plans yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I guess uh, if we could have a, a motion to continue to July 13th, please. Make a motion that we continue the Realtail extension notice of intent DEP file number 14-1400 to July 13th meeting, is that correct? Second. Mm -hmm. July 13th meeting? Yep. And that's the second day. Second, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, so we'll look to see everybody down July at the site. 13th. What about the site visit? Are we gonna schedule or are you gonna Yeah, yeah we'll schedule on. via email and I'll call you. Okay. Because I gotta check Steve's schedule and then your, the member schedules. And she posted together, she's great. Mm. <laughs> Uh, okay, the last, uh, is there any other old and new business other than the, meet, the minute? Nope, just the minutes. minutes. Yeah, just the meeting minutes. Just this. Uh, okay, so has everyone had a chance to review the meeting minutes from 413, 2023 and 825, 2022? Yes. 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 Right. I read them. And does anyone have any comments, <laughs> uh, suggested edits? No, I didn't I had a comment any. on the August ones. Okay. Um, and that's. I was having deja vu because there's a notice of intent item for seven Chevalier that says continue to September 8th, but then like later down on the same page, we had a discussion about it. And I think I made the same comment. So then I was wondering if we already approved these minutes. There were two different items. I, yes, I, it different. may have been their peer and the doc at the same time. I'll double okay. check those, Vanessa. <laughs> okay, because I felt cool. like I already, I already made this comment about something being continued and then having it the discussion on the uh, on the minutes as well yeah, I think yeah. the doc was probably continued um, I'll double check those if the Commission was okay with 413 23 we can approve those and I'll um, oh you're right it's two different file numbers sorry I didn't okay. know sorry good. even then better I feel better now that there was no mistake okay. yeah we're right, good. good so then you're all set with it Vanessa yes sorry about that no nope. don't that's okay okay uh, so someone can make a motion for what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. I make the motion that we accept the minutes for 413 2020. 2020? 20, 20? 2023. 20, okay. And August 25th, 2023. 22. 22. Whatever it says on the agenda. 22. And I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, okay. Okay, no other business, and we have two new members. We were supposed to see Mary tonight, but yeah, I believe Mary was going to come and sit and observe. It sounds like she'll be at the next meeting. They both start July thirteenth. And okay, and John, I yeah. John, I forget his last name. Okay, so, so they'll uh, be sitting up. They'll be sitting up here, won't they? Yeah. yeah good. Okay, uh, so if someone make a motion to adjourn, I'll make a I'll motion. We adjourn the meeting. <laughs> I second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks Vanessa, have a nice vacation. Have a good trip, Vanessa. Thank, Thank you. Good. Thank you, guys. Okay, I'll see everyone. Thanks, Mike. Okay. okay.